I would just like to say that I wish we had another spring break next week. You know, so in other words, at the end of class today, spring break. But no. Unfortunately, we don't have it. But I have something good that I know will cheer you up. Even though we don't have a spring break this weekend, we're going to have a ton of homework. In fact, we're going to have a double homework. Yeah. And so it's going to... <laughs> it's the, the variety of facial expressions for, for <laughs> I just saw was <laughs> was lovely. Uh, we're gonna have it. It's not gonna be. It's gonna be like a big homework, but they're two different topics: uh, angular momentum and then heat. Uh, so I'm gonna split them up into two f smaller assignments. Uh, before I keep going with that, I want to mention to you that there was uh, a problem with the uh, YouTube. Uh, before I rendered it into video, I, I added in uh, some notation to it and inadvertently budged the diagram and didn't restore it. So it's supposed to look like this. Uh, and I was comparing the comet elliptical orbit, uh, very eccentric, very oval shaped. Uh, to the Earth's orbit, which is pretty close to a perfect circle. Uh, and I added these two points that I mentioned, aphelion. Can you bring the mic down a little bit? Quite a bit, actually. It's way too hot. Uh, and then perihelion. That's better. All right, so perihelion is down here. That's the point of closest approach. And aphelion is the part of the point of furthest distance uh, from the sun. And I mentioned that uh, in terms of the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum, L equals MRV. Uh, and here's the, you know, the basic vocabulary if you want to jot it down. For something that's orbiting the sun, the point of farthest approach or most distant point is called aphelion. Uh, and the point of nearest approach is called perihelion. Now, if you're orbiting the Earth, they use a different word. So like a satellite of NASA that's orbiting the Earth, uh, you talk about apogee, that's the furthest point from G, uh, geo, Earth. And perigee is the point closest to Earth. So the, the lowest part of its orbit. And some um, satellites have definitely... Uh, elliptical orbits, depending on what they're trying to do. Now, if you're talking about a star orbiting another star or a planet orbiting another star, you use the word astron. So ap astron is the point of furthest distance for something orbiting another star. And periastron is the point closest to that other star. So that's kind of how it works. And dynamically speaking, Sir Isaac Newton would say, at aphelion, apog, apastron, your object is orbiting at its slowest speed. And that its fastest speed occurs at perihelion, perigee, periastron, peri whatever. And there's a few other words that they use, but those are the three main ones. All right, now... In the light blue box to the right, I have a side note and, and concerning um, circular orbits. If you think about it, a circular orbit, it's all the same distance from the sun or all the same distance from the earth, the center of the earth, or all the same distance from the center of that star that you're looking at. So there's nothing that's a, a, a unique peri, periastron, perigee, perihelion, for a circular orbit. Or you could say it's all perihelion. It's all the nearest. Or you could say it's all aphelion. And for that reason, there's no variation in the speed. It's a uniform speed. Now, the velocity is changing as you go, you know, because the direction. But it's a centrifugal, uh, whoops, centripetal force. So it does, and on a circular orbit, it doesn't change the speed. Now, on an elliptical orbit, yeah, it does change the speed. You gain speed on the way in to peri, 
uh, helion, and you lose speed on the way back out from perihelion out to aphelion because um, it's working against the velocity a little bit, right? But on a circular orbit, that is not the case, all right? So, um, so yeah, that's the, the idea. And, and as I mentioned last time, at perihelion, at aphelion, the formula L equals MRV is correct because everything is at right angles. R, the position vector, and the V vector, the velocity vector, are at right angles. Anywhere else than those two points, and you've got um, a little bit of, you know, an angle, an obtuse or an acute angle. So you got to do a lot of trig and stuff. Uh, but at those two points, it's, it's definitely nice. Uh, so I just want to correct that and add a little reinforcement to it. Uh, now, the other thing that we talked about last time was calculating a moment of inertia. And we did it for a simple two-object symmetric system. And uh, some authors refer to this as the rigid rotator. Okay, it's a, something that rotates about the symmetry axis, you know, right down the middle. And the, it's idealized so that the bar connecting them is massless. And, uh, but you have your two masses, your two significant masses, the same distance away from the rotation axis. And we calculated that. We calculated MR squared for the object on the left, uh, and then MR squared for the object on the right, and then added them together. Let me get my, okay. So here's MR squared uh, for the object on the left, and here it is for the object on the right. And then uh, R squared, 2.1 squared was 4.41. Then we multiplied that by 7. And we did it again over here, 4.41 times 7. And the total worked out, um, when you add both of those up, 61.74 kilogram meters squared. And just to... Uh, reinforce to you the moment of inertia encodes the resistance to the change in the spin or the angular momentum state. So the more angular momentum, or excuse me, the more moment of inertia you have, kilogram meter squared, um, the harder it is to spin something. All right. And, uh, and we're going to get into some more examples of that in a second. But go ahead and get your calculator out and get your clicker ready. And we're going to do a multiple choice question uh, on the eye clicker. And hopefully you can get this um, calculated. We're gonna do another moment of inertia calculation like the one we just went over. Matter of fact, let's just go back here for a second. Does anyone have any questions about how that worked out? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, let's calculate. Here it is. Two masses, 2.5 kilograms each. Uh, total distance, 2.80 meters. So 1.4 and 1.4. Go ahead and calculate the total moment of inertia about this axis. All right, can you bring the lights all the way up? And we'll give you the lights and you can just take a minute. And it's this is lecture, so definitely consult with your neighbor um, and if you don't have a neighbor remember to sit next to somebody next time and uh, you can benefit from their wisdom or maybe they can benefit from your wisdom and vice versa You just had the most mischievous look on your face. <laughs> so just just so you know, she was 
She looked like she was about to play a trick on you. Very mischievous. <laughs> All right. Okay, 52 answers. There. That's right. 34, 2.5 squared, 6.25, 1.4 quantity squared, 1.4 quantity squared, 4. So that's 1. Point One point nine six kilogram meter squared. Let's see. Okay, one minute starting now. You got a problem? Dude. This is burning my grits here. Go nitro. Your battery indicator is 100%. We're not getting any letters. Battery is, and it's going go nitro. That means the buttons are probably malfunctioning. So it means you got to get somebody else's or a new, brand new one. What from cheatme.com or something or no, from like Craigslist. Craig yeah. Craigslist. <laughs> yeah. Somebody gave you uh, but it was working throughout the whole semester. Yeah. Uh, so the my recommendation would be if a roommate has one and they're not using it Tuesday and Thursday, noon to one thirty, you can use theirs. Just register it through web courses. You're sunk for today, but we only got a couple questions here, so You know what might ha help, Miss Darian? Take the batteries out, and yeah, it's just not. Yeah, but see, your battery indicator is a hundred percent. You know what I sometimes do, Darian? I take the battery and kind of scuff it up on my shirt. Yeah, scuff it up on your blue jeans. That might help. It used, it used to help. I don't know if it still is. Do you have a little bit of corrosion in the battery there? Ooh. That's all you think that's all you Possibly. Yeah. I mean, like, it doesn't look like it's affecting the battery, but it might be affecting the battery. Yeah. No, you know what else it means? It might it might mean that the, the contacts for the buttons are also corroded. Yeah, that's what I when, he, yeah, how much did you pay for it? I paid like 25 bucks. Dude. Yeah, so you're, you're SOL until you get a new one. Anyways. It's really unfortunate. Yeah, you've been clicking for most of the time though, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you, sh you should be all right. Okay. But get a new one or, uh, you know, like a set of friends or a roomies or something like that. You know, midnight, just don't do the midnight requisition. You know, the five finger discount. Just let them know first. <laughs> okay. I hear you, I hear you. All right. Good luck. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, ten seconds to vote. Another ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Geniuses, zero. Yeah, uh, you guys are pretty much geniuses. 93% of you got it right. Uh, for those of you that didn't, just to review, here's the calculation. And if you got it right, maybe you want to double, jot, double check and jot this down too. All right, you're summing, you know, that Greek, capital Greek sigma is S for sigma, S for sum. We're adding up MR squared for each pixel. So there they are. There's MR squared for the one on the left, MR squared for the one on the right. Now, if you're doing some complex shape, you know, like a wrench or something like that, you got to do each MR squared, you know, each cubic millimeter differently, you know, so, but this one's symmetric and everything works out nice. Okay, so uh, 1.40 meters quantity squared is 1.96 square meters. And you multiply that by 2.5 kilograms, and, uh, and you add those two together, you get 9.8. So that's really good. You guys, 93% uh, of you got it correct. So uh, raise your hand if you got that one correct. Okay, nice. All right. Now, uh, a couple things I want to uh, reinforce with you um, to finish up the moment of inertia concept. It's kind of a mysterious thing, but the this... This quantity, MR squared, encodes the, um, how easy it is to speed something up spin-wise or to slow it down spin-wise. So to go from 10 RPM up to 20 RPM or from 10 RPM down to 5 RPM, you know, spin it down, um, it's, it's a space, it's, it's more than just mass. You know, so point A to point B, straight line acceleration, F equals MA, that's just mass, all right? Uh, and so, or translational acceleration is the technical term for that, all right? But for, for spinning, you're not going from point A to point B, not necessarily. You might just be spinning in place. And you change position, but you never get anywhere. You know, you're always back to, you're going in circles. All right, but that's all right. You still have this, um, this quantity. So, and for those of you that have had calculus, this sigma is replaced by an integral sign. And that's where the, the tricky things go. But, you know, a, a rigid rotator, you don't need a calculus. You just add them up. It's very simple. Now, here's some objects. Uh, where you need a little bit of calculus, and I've got a table made up. Go ahead and uh, make a table, f uh, five rows, title row, and then four objects. Here are the first two objects, a thin hoop, and as I mentioned in the book, a thin hoop or a, you know, like a wheel is made up of a bunch of rigid rotators, smaller and smaller, and, you know, separated by 10 degrees, five degrees, one degree, you know, and as many as you want, and eventually it'll, it'll um, be indistinguishable from a smoothly constructed hoop. Now for that, the moment of inertia is mR squared, the mass of the object and the square of its radius multiplied together. And my wonderful students, there's always going to be um, any object for which uh, Shanice, that you, you calculate moment of inertia, it's going to have a mass. You know, you could put it in a balance and figure out its mass, so many kilograms. And every object that you consider, it's going to have some distant scale. Now, a simple object like a hoop or a cylinder has a radius. And that, that cylinder also has a length along the axis you know it's a, this one's fairly long but it's the same no matter how uh, far along the axis it is if it's more like a disc a solid disc same formula okay but now this one is a little bit different okay um, the solid cylinder um, has got this factor of one half in front of it and my wonderful students, that is where the, you know, the, the students in calculus class 
would use their calculus and a little bit of trig, all right? Because that factor, one half, encodes the different distribution of mass for a solid cylinder, all right? So for that thin hoop, all the masses out there at R square, at, at distance R from the center, all right? That's the definition of a hoop, all right? But for a solid cylinder, you know, you've got mass out there at distance r, at radius r, but you've got some at 0.8 r, and 0.6 r, and, point, you know, and, and all the intermediate distances. And when you do that using calculus and trig and stuff, it boils down to mr squared times that factor. So the geometry and the distribution of matter are encoded in that one factor, one half. All right, and I cannot uh, overestimate the importance of that. All right, so make sure you make a note of that. All right, that new factor. So, so the Cinchy one, MR squared, basic, 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 basic. The simplest, uh, after the rigid rotator, it's the simplest. And then solid cylinder, fairly easy, got to do calculus, but it gives you a one half out in front, still it still is reminiscent of the hoop. Now, let me show you the next two items on this table. All right, here we go. First one is, a, the next one is a sphere. All right, now, this one, I've got the sphere kind of tilted and the axis is going through, you know, north pole to north pole. So it's going right through the center of the sphere. Now, you don't have to spin um, a sphere about that axis, but this is the easiest one to do. If the, if the spin axis, you know, uh, a baseball is going to spin about its center of mass, all right? No matter how you put a spin on a tennis ball, it's going to spin around its center of mass, all right? Now, if you attach it to an axle, you can drill an axis through any part of a sphere and, you know, turn it around that. But this one, you know, the axis is through the center of mass, all right? Now, here's the factor. And, and again, this is a, a, a factor. There's a mass and the square of the radius. You know, the hoop has got a radius. The cylinder's got a radius. And the sphere's got a radius. All right, that's nice. Okay. And, and it's, they each have a mass. And the moment of inertia is, is, is mr squared times a factor. Now, for the hoop, the factor is just one, so you don't even write it in. For the cylinder, it's one half, and you have to write it in. And for the sphere, it's two fifths. So again, you have another new factor. This one's two fifths. And it encodes a different distribution of matter. All right? Yeah, and, and you know that the formula, here's another way to think about it. You know, the formula for the, for the uh, volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times the height of the cylinder, all right? The formula for the uh, volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r to the third power. So volume formulas are different. Moment of inertia formulas are different. But there's still an m and an r squared because every moment of inertia is going to be kilogram meters per second in some way, all right? Now, let me park this concept up to the top here, and let's take a look at the stick. Now, this one's a little different. This one's a, a long, thin stick, and every centimeter's got so many grams of matter in it, all right? And so this one's not really, it doesn't have a radius per se, but it does have a length that I've marked it out there, length L. And this, and you guys, I'm sorry, this diagram, was uh, supposed to be in the textbook. Uh, and the publisher, for some reason I don't know, did not put this in. And I worked like days to get this thing to what I wanted it to be. Uh, anyways, this one, ding, another uh, geometric factor. This one's 1 12th. But now this one doesn't have a radius, but it does have the length scale for a stick. 
you know, in a kind of an idealized stick. So not a stick that you take off a tree. You know, it's got a, you know, it's kind of bumpy and curvaceous and everything. But just a straight idealized stick, so many grams per, per meter of length. Um, 1 12th m times the square of the length of the stick. So it's, it's a mass. It's got a mass. You know, you can measure it in a balance. And instead of a radius that describes it perfectly, you have a length that describes it perfectly. So that's the length scale, L. And we square it. And then, but the geometric distribution of mass encodes into that 1 12th. And no matter what kind of symmetric object you take, you're going to get a mass times a square of a distance. Or, you know, and here's an interesting one. Uh, if you take a rectangular box and do the spin axis uh, through the center, then you'll have the square of the length plus the square of the width plus the square of the height. And then you'll have some geometric factors for it. So it's kind of cool for, for uh, any object. You know, be cool, you know, one I have not done is a pyramid. And that would be really bodacious, the calculus for that. I'll have to assign that to Darian because she's, she's, the, she's the boss of that kind of stuff, I guess, trig and whatnot. But a pyramid, now the thing about it is, and actually a pyramid is, is interesting to think about in this context because, you know, moment of inertia, angular momentum, and angular momentum for electrons in an atom, in a molecule, define the shape of the crystal that may form. Let me repeat that. The angular momentum states of the various atoms in the molecule will lead to, you know, like a, uh, a tetrahedron shaped crystal. Uh, what is a, a diamond is a cubic crystal, I think. Okay, so if you have a diamond ring. Uh, any, uh, let's see, quartz, that's hexagonal. A hexagonal crystal. All that stuff is controlled by the angular momentum states. Uh, so that's kind of reflected in this geometric understanding. And it all traces back to this, the most simplest symmetric array that we can think of. All right, the rigid rotator. And that's all in, your, in chapter five of your textbook on angular momentum. Now, I want to go through another concept with you. You guys did good on calculating. Now I want to go through something with you called the right-hand rule. And this will help to give us an understanding. Keep your clickers ready, by the way. The right-hand rule will help to give us an understanding of the demonstration that we had uh, two Tuesdays ago uh, with the bicycle wheel that we, we handed to the student in one way. And the student flipped it. And when they flipped it, they started spinning themselves, even if they were at rest. And so the right-hand rule is going to help us understand that. So the right-hand rule for angular momentum and other spinning things is simply this. You use your right hand. Okay, everybody raise your right hand. No, the other right hand. The right right hand. The correct. All right. It's good. It's a little IQ test. If I ever see you going on, on exam three and, and I see you raising this hand, your, your other right hand, I'll say, no, wrong right hand. Use your, use your right hand. And I've, I've done that myself. I use, I've done calculations of angular momentum or something, and I, I'm writing with my right hand, and I'm using my left hand to, and it, <laughs> everything's backwards. So what you do is you curl the fingers of your right hand in the same way that the object's spinning, okay? And then the thumb points in the direction that you would write the angular velocity arrow or the angular momentum arrow or the torque arrow, all right? You know, so, so something, you know, 
you know, you can't write a directional velocity vector v for something that's spinning in place. But you, you express its angular velocity using the right-hand rule, okay? So let's take a look at an example. And as I mentioned, this will help us understand the bicycle wheel demonstration. Uh, let's take a look at the Orlando Eye, which is a big, big wheel. Now, when you um, look at it from the west, here it is. Raise your hand if you've been on the Orlando Eye. Anybody? Is it scary? Do you, no? Good. I might go on it if it's not too scary. Anyway, so you're looking at it from the west, and it spins clockwise in this sense. So here's how you do it, okay? So you take your hand, and you, you orient the, go ahead and do it with your right hand, all right? So your, your right hand, the fingers of your right hand are, are, are curled in the sense that the Orlando eye moves, that, that it spins. So your thumb points in the direction uh, that the angular momentum and the angular velocity arrow would be. So the angular velocity vector would be into the screen. Now go ahead and write a little circle with an X in the middle of it. Okay, that is the symbol for into the notebook paper or into the computer screen. All right, and that's what we got here. You know, here's my right hand. Okay, and no, I'm curling it in the, not, not that direction, I'm curling it in the direction that it's spinning. Okay, so you align your fingers in the direction. So it's like your fingers are pointing in the direction of the spin. And then the thumb... Uh, points away from you into, into the screen here or, or east. It's pointing east, all right? And so uh, you could put a big circle with an X at the hub uh, of, the, uh, of the wheel. Now, let's go to the other side of the Orlando Eye. All right, so here's a picture of a guy standing on the other side. All right, now from this perspective, it's going this way, all right? And so you, you still get um, uh, a, a, an angular velocity arrow heading to the east, but now it's coming up out of the page, all right? So you'd sketch it in uh, something like this. So here's kind of a uh, schematic diagram. So there's your Orlando eye, and you're behind it now. All right, so it's spinning in this sense, and there's your angular velocity. So kind of sketch that one in if you can. All right, and that corresponds to the right-hand rule. All right. Now the reason that we're gonna we're we're going over this is because when the student on the lab stool, lab stool on a turntable, that student gets the bicycle wheel. It's got angular momentum downward, and then he flips the bicycle wheel so that its angular momentum is upward. So he's doing, it's not delta P, it's delta L. He's changing the angular momentum state. And when he does that, he absorbs angular momentum from the wheel. And that causes his angular momentum state to change. All right, so let's... Let's, let's do another clicker question, see if you guys can visualize this stuff properly. Multiple choice. All right, here we go. Get your clicker ready. Question number two for today. All right, so here's your, you're standing at the playground and it's spinning in that sense. And you got four choices. Could be C or D. Choice number five. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so right hand rule, and just kind of, you know. Dior, make sure you use the right hand, don't use the left hand, because it's, you know, then you're. That's your right hand. 
Just checking. Do not let me catch you napping. But, you know, if, you, if I see somebody doing that on the test with their left hand and they're writing with their right hand, I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and I'll just tell you, wrong hand. All right, 20 seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, and go ahead and display this. Uh, now, uh, there seems to be 50%. How many people voted here? 120, exactly 50% voted for C, but a bunch of you voted for A, a bunch of you voted for B, uh, and a few for D and E. All right, switch back to the regular, please. Thank you. Now, the correct answer is C. All right. All right. Now, we got a real brain burner coming up and I'm going to give you this question it's multiple choice and I'm going to talk about it all right this is this is the cinchy one okay the tough one's coming up now we're going to assume we're going to think back to that demonstration and who was it that uh who was the young lady that uh demonstrated uh, she's, I don't, I can't remember right, I don't see her. Anyways, um, we had the student holding the bicycle wheel. The student was at rest. So write down angular momentum of the student equals zero. All right. In that demonstration. The bicycle wheel that we handed to them initially was had upward angular momentum. So write down initial angular momentum of the bicycle wheel was positive upward. Okay, because it was it was spinning in this sense. Right? I mean you guys might not have noticed it, but that's that's the sense that it right. So we had upward angular momentum. All right, so that was the initial angular momentum of the wheel. Right, so initial angular momentum of the student, initial angular momentum of the wheel, total is, tw is you know, whatever the wheel has. Right? Then the student flips it. It's still spinning at the same rate. It hasn't changed its shape or anything. But now it's, you know, negative. It's downward after they flip it. All right, now... Um, Here's your question. Go ahead and start it. I've given you some numbers. Now, zero for the student initially. And let's just call it 20 and minus 20 for the wheel. All right? 20 to start, positive 20 upward. And you see it in the diagram. And then after the student flips it, negative 20, in other words, 20 downward, kilogram meters squared per second. All right? So then the student. How much angular momentum delta L for the student does the student have to acquire in order to conserve angular momentum? Does he gain 20 upward, minus 20 downward, 40 upward, minus 40 down, or does he, gain, does he absorb zero angular momentum? So think carefully. And if you and you know what you can do? Think exactly back to um, the uh, skateboarder. You know, the two skateboarders. Remember? Exchange of momenta. And we'll work this one out. 
I want. Oh boy, look at this. Good. I'm glad to see you guys talking it over and pointing at the diagrams and stuff. It's very good. So you got the right hand rule. You got people going like this. Good. This. And let me just tell you, if you can get this one right. And I know that. But, you know, if you, if you get caught napping on this, we'll just work it out. We'll work out the numbers. One minute to make your decision. Look at that arrangement. That is interesting. Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One, zero. Uh, raise your hand if you voted for 40, positive. Raise your hand. Whoever voted for 40, positive, you got it. That is the correct answer. Now let's work out why that, uh-oh, I got to do something here. Hold on. We're going to work out why that is, but I have to change something on my slide real quick. Come on, where are you? All right, so here's how it works. All right. For the wheel, delta L, go ahead and write this down. Delta L for the wheel is LF minus LI for the wheel. All right. So that's negative 20. That's the final. Negative 20 kilogram meter square per second. Minus the initial. Now, the initial was positive, so I put parentheses and then positive 20 kilogram meters squared per second. All right, so delta L for the wheel is minus 40 kilogram meters squared per second. Now, just like with the two skateboarders, what the wheel gives up, it gives to the skate to the other skateboarder and the same thing here so the student gets 40 positive right uh, for his and he started with zero so the student started with zero he wasn't spinning but when he changes the, the orientation of the wheel now he's got 40 positive and he's spinning in the positive sense, in the right hand rule positive sense. And the, and, and the bicycle wheels spinning in the negative uh, right hand rule sense. All right? So just to reinforce, the student and bicycle wheel demonstration with plus or minus delta L is similar to, and by the same token, conservation of angular momentum similar to the skateboarders that push off and get plus or minus delta p all right and believe it or not that interaction between the student you, you might think, you know, I keep getting back to atoms and molecules, but it's incredible the, the, the fact that 
atoms do this, it's called spin flipping. And but we're still trying to figure out, you know, why atoms and molecules, uh, or, or figure out how to get a, uh, electrons, atoms, and molecules to, to flip their spins. And you know what we're, you know what it's going to lead to? It's going to lead to quantum electronics that are going to put, you know, half the internet inside of an iPhone if we can get that kind of electronics figured out. It's kind of amazing to think about. So guys are trying to figure this out and, and do it in a reliable and an industrial manner so that it can be just done ultra reliable and ultra secure. All right, let's talk about chapter six and heat concepts. And we're gonna be on this for the next uh, two lectures, today and, and probably Tuesday. Now look at that picture. You know, I was, I was driving back from uh, Fort Lauderdale a couple summers ago, and we decided to go up through, the, up through you know, uh, Clewiston and over by Lake Okeechobee and through the Everglades and, and up through that way. And there's a lot of real flat ground, no trees or anything, just a lot of uh, sugarcane fields up there. And we saw storms, you know, we were driving between them. They, they didn't look quite this cool, but they were pretty interesting to look at. This is out in Montana. That's one of my old stomping grounds. Uh, and that's a big heat, heat engine, you know, a thunderstorm. That's a supercell. Now here's a, a name of renown, James Prescott Jewell. And an interesting guy, he, he was not uh, a professor or anything, but he was just really smart uh, back in the 1800s. And he, you know, we call the, uh, the metric unit uh, of energy the jewel after him, James Prescott Jewell. And one of his most famous experiments was simply this, that stirring up water, a measurable amount of kinetic energy dumped into water uh, with a device that looks like this. Uh, in other words, a paddle wheel connected to a weight and with pulleys and stuff. And the pulley, you know, descend or the weight descends, you know, 40 centimeters. And therefore, so many uh, MGH uh, joules of uh, energy from the gravitational field of the Earth into the spin of those paddle wheels. You know, it's because it's all connected to a pulley system, right? So the weight falls, you know, 40 centimeters, the paddles spin up, and then as soon as the weight stops, it hits the floor, um, the paddles stop, and all the kinetic energy is in the water. And what James Prescott Jewell found out is that the temperature of the water increases, and that the kinetic energy in the water is correlated to the temperature of the water. And that led to something called the kinetic theory of matter, right? which you can read about in chapter 6-3 and, and through there. The idea being that um, the temperature that we measure macroscopically with a thermometer is a single macroscopic number that encodes the average kinetic energy of the mass of water or whatever it is that you're measuring, you know, your, your body or soup or, you know, whatever you're cooking, whatever you're measuring the temperature of, the, the molecules and atoms have an average kinetic energy you know, and that's what the temperature actually measures. Now, here's another heat-related concept, and we're going to be working on all these concepts in the next one or two lectures. Two objects at different temperatures, are in, they're not in thermal equilibrium, okay? And that leads to the idea of heat transport. So if you have a hot object in contact with a cool object, heat energy and you can think of it as kinetic energy, it's going to flow from the hot one into the cold one. And kinetic energy will go from the cold one over to the hot one 
but not nearly as much. So the net flow of kinetic energy is from the hot object to the cold object. Okay, we're going to talk about that. That's heat transport. And then here's another concept. Different elements and molecules cool off and heat up differently, and they have different boiling points. The phases of matter, you know, solid, gaseous, liquid, you know, melting point, freezing point and then a little bit higher uh, condensation point or vaporization point, you know. So, so gas, so water vapor up in the atmosphere, that's, the, that's how rain forms. You know, the water vapor, you, it, it's a gas, right? So you can't really see it, but it rises up from the earth as the sun heats it up and it rises. And that's what, you know, hawks and, and eagles use and they, they circle around on those big thermals and gliders too, they can use a thermal uh, of rising water vapor and rising air um, to, uh, to, you know, to fly in. And that, so the water vapor rises up and you know, when you get up higher and higher elevation, it gets colder and colder and the air pressure is lower and lower. So at the right temperature and pressure combination, that gas, the vapor, the water vapor, will condense into micro droplets. Very small droplets, and they're so small, they're still held aloft by the currents of air. And you've seen that. You know, like uh, dust. You know, if somebody's driving down a dusty road, you'll see the dust hanging in the air because the dust particles are so big that they're kind of, you, know, you know, the car disturbs and makes a little bit of wind behind it and it stirs up the dust, and eventually it settles down. The same thing with uh, uh, micro droplets. The micro droplets, the, the, the water vapor will rise, the water vapor, the water droplets will form, and that is what you see as a cloud. A cloud is not water vapor, it is liquid water in very small droplets that are still so small, they're held aloft. They don't fall, they're just kind of floating around up there, nice. But eventually, if the conditions change, those same droplets will form bigger and bigger droplets, they'll join together, and at some point, they'll be big enough that they'll no longer be able to be held aloft, and they fall, and that is rain. And if you're out west, sometimes you'll see rain falling out of a thundercloud Heading to the ground, you'll see these, you know, the streaks of rain, but the air below the cloud is so dry that it evaporates. And so you have rain leaving the cloud, but it never reaches the ground because it evaporates on the way. Um, you never see that here in Florida hardly, but uh, out west you see it all the time. Anyway, so rain will eventually, uh, and that's all the phases of matter. You know, so the heat of vaporization, the heat of con condensation, so on and so forth. Now, to get a handle on all this stuff, one of the things that we need to work on is the Kelvin temperature scale. And the Kelvin temperature scale is not, um, it, it's, it's the scientific temperature scale. Now, Celsius is metric, and Kelvin temperature scale is based on Celsius. Fahrenheit, you know, named after Prof Professor von Fahrenheit over there in Germany, that's you know, some people use that scientifically, but most people use uh, Kelvin scale. Um, and it's based on Celsius, so um, it's the same basic idea, but a different baseline. Now, for, uh, for the Celsius, the baseline temperature is the freezing point of water. So zero on the Celsius scale is where water freezes, and 100 degrees Celsius is where water boils at sea level. Okay, so it's a little bit different, you know, up in Denver. You know, the boiling temperature and the uh, freezing temperature are a little different at altitude. But at sea level, ordinary sea level atmospheric pressure, uh, yeah, zero and 100 on the Celsius scale. Now, the freezing point for the Kelvin scale is something called absolute zero. All right, and colloquially, that point is, you know, some people say, well, that's the place where all molecular motion ceases, absolute zero. 
But really, that's not the best way to describe it. It's better to say this is the point at which no work can be extracted. You know, if you have a, a hot object, you know, like a nuclear reactor, you can extract work from it by running a steam turbine, you know, use the heat of the reactor to boil water. And then the, 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 uh, the boiling water drives a turbine. And then after it goes through the turbine, you, you cool it, you turn it back into liquid, and you put it back into the reactor. And the same thing with an oil-fired uh, electrical plant, uh, gas, coal, anything. You know, you, you get something hot, and then you drive a wheel. And the wheel uh, runs a generator, right? And so those are heat. You're, you're extracting energy, converting into electricity from heat. And theoretically, there's a point at which you can no longer do that. And that is absolute zero. The temperature below which no matter can be found. All right? Because if you could find something lower than that, then you'd be able to extract energy from something right above that. So there is this thing, and we've measured it. It's negative 273 uh, on the uh, Celsius scale. I think it's negative 273.15, something like that. Yeah, that's what this diagram shows. All right, so negative 273.15 on Celsius. And so what that means is that zero degrees Celsius is 273 positive on the Kelvin scale. All right, so that's this one, item number four. And by that same token, um, Celsius, you go up 100 Celsius degrees to get to the boiling point. So another 100 on the Kelvin scale gets you to 373. And so 373 is the boiling point of liquid water at sea level on a nice day. You know, fair weather at sea level, fair weather at Cocoa Beach. All right. And so now the, the benefit of the Kelvin scale is that it's physically um, always a positive number. And so that corresponds to the fact that uh, Dior, that uh, kinetic energies are always positive, you know, because the kinetic energy is always a one half mv squared. So everything in there is positive. There's no negative. There's no negative mass. There's no negative v squared. All right, so kinetic energy average is always going to be an average of positive numbers. Therefore, the average is always going to be positive, and that's good. Because, and so the Kelvin scale starts at zero and nothing below that. It's always a positive number, just like there's always a positive number for whatever kinetic energy average you may have. And so that's the benefit of it. Now, let's try a little bit of a workout. All right, now this is a clicker question, multiple choice. And it looks a little bit different than my normal ones, but here it is. Room temperature Celsius, generally considered to be 20 degrees Celsius. So in the Kelvin scale, that would be what? All right, so look at your examples from the, you know, so it's, Hopefully it's cinchy to figure this out. So look at your notes. So what's 20? Two seventy three Kelvin is zero degrees Celsius. Three seventy three Kelvin is one hundred Celsius. So between those two you should be able to figure out this one. 30 seconds. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One, zero. 
Okay, yeah, uh, C is correct. 75% uh, of you got that correct. Yeah, so you just add 20, you know, whatever you got above zero Celsius, add that to 273, and that'll be the Kelvin. Or add 273 to it. Okay, question number four, I guess. And you better get this one right because I was just talking about it. So you can see that it's better to have two homework assignments, one for angular momentum, stuff like that, and one for temperatures and heat and stuff. So. Thirty seconds. Ten, nine, eight. Wait, wait a minute. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Two, one, zero. Uh, yeah, 81% of you got it right. Uh, and so here's the bottom line. You know, positive temperatures only is useful because kinetic energy is always positive too. So average kinetic energy is positive. All right. Now, uh, one of the interesting things about heat phenomena is the, the correlation between the temperature of an object and its color. Now, I should uh, add to this the temperature of an incandescent object and the color of the incandescent object. So like the old-fashioned light bulbs, you know, that emitted heat or emitted energy, uh, light, because they were hot. And if you touched them, you could burn your hand. Um, those are incandescent light bulbs. Now, here's an incandescent light source. The star Betelgeuse. It's a red supergiant in the surface uh, in the in the constellation Orion. And can you guys see that there's variations in the color? All right. Those are actually uh, well, we wouldn't call them sunspots because it's Betelgeuse. It's not the sun. But those are actually you you ginormous. Sunspots on the surface of Betelgeuse. The surface of Betelgeuse is a certain temperature, and therefore it primarily emits in the red. That's where we see most of its radiation. Here's a, uh, a globular cluster. Go ahead and make a note. This is called M13, the letter M and then 13. The uh, cluster M13, and what you can see in this one Eh, not so much on the computer screen, but in YouTube you'll see it. Uh, there's a lot of blue stars, and blue stars are hotter than Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is gigantic, but the surface is not that hot. There are a lot of stars, like uh, Sirius is kind of bluish white, uh, and Sirius is fairly close to Orion. And, you know, when we look at different clusters and galaxies and stuff, we see a lot of blue stars too. Now, um, yeah, so this is cluster M13. Uh, here's a, this is a false color image of our SUN, and this one was taken 2017, uh, about 11 months ago, uh, February 28th of 2017. And this one is false color ultraviolet. So they made everything bluish according to the brightness at this wavelength, 17.1 nanometers. Now, light at that wavelength is typically emitted from objects that have a temperature of about a million degrees Kelvin. All right? And so uh, this is from the 
uh, Soho spacecraft. And I've, I've got it down last night at 8 p.m. actually, uh, last February 28th at about 8 p.m. All right, now, um, I wanna get down to the nitty gritty of heating and cooling um, and I'm gonna give you a vocabulary word to study over the weekend specific heat now uh, we're not we don't have quite enough time Alexis to go through this calculation uh, but we're going to go through it on Tuesday uh, you know we're going to melt some water get a cup of tea uh, and I'm going to show you how to calculate the energy required for that and so when you're when you're doing your homework you're going to have two homeworks all right and um, I'll give you some reading assignment too, and it's basically in chapter six, read about specific heat. All right, you're dismissed. I'll see you guys on Tuesday.